Thanks for joining us for today's live stream service. We pray that you'll be edified and uplifted by today's message. We want to make sure during this time that we're connected with you. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and like us on Instagram. And don't forget, if you need to update your email, phone number, or contact information, please do so at newhopechurch.net. Online giving is also available at newhopechurch.net. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the service. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church live stream service. We're grateful that you chose to participate with us this morning. We as a church family want to make sure that we stay in communication with you. So if you have prayer requests or anything else, any other needs that we can fulfill, then please let us know through the Connect card. If you go online to our website, newhopechurch.net, there's a resources tab and under there is the Connect card. And if you fill that in, it'll go directly to our church office. If you want to bypass that, you can email at office at newhopechurch.net. 
Thanks for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoy the service. Let me be 
Good morning and happy Mother's Day. You know, it's been slightly over a decade since I've been celebrating Mother's Day without the physical presence of my own mom. I always have to just wave at her and know that uh, she's part of a group that continues to cheer our family on from heaven. Uh, this is a most peculiar Sunday. Uh, for 10, 11 Mother's Day now, I've been learning how to celebrate Mother's Day without my mom. But I've always been able to celebrate it with hundreds of other moms in church on Sunday morning. And because of our current circumstances, I'm having to figure out how to celebrate Mother's Day without any moms present in the room with me. But to all of you who are present by watching our live stream, moms, thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do every moment of every day. Thank you for the difference you've made, not only in your own children, but the difference that you have made in the lives of others who've come under your influence. We are so very, very grateful for each and every one of you. So may you experience God's best. And don't forget, we've got a little something for you here in the church parking lot. So we hope after the service, you'll swing by and, and get our Mother's Day 2020 free gift we have for you. Uh, let me highlight a few prayer requests, give you some updates, and also share a few new things with you. Uh, Mike Germonte, one of the gentlemen who sings in our worship team Sunday after Sunday, uh, he went up to visit his mom on Tuesday and was able to, to sing for her and uh, to pray with her. Uh, her background was, uh, is rooted in her Catholic faith, and uh, they're not letting the priest into the room. She was, uh, she was under hospice care. And... Um, Mike got to even give her last rites 
and she passed away then the next day. So I want you to be remembering to pray for the, uh, the Giramonte family. Um, many of you remember Major Ian Thomas, who used to come and speak for us here. He's one who's had significant influence in my life. And in fact, uh, I still enjoy rereading all of his books. And every night when I go for a walk, I often have an earpiece in and I listen to some of Major's old sermons that still are refreshing to my soul. Uh, Major passed away several years ago, and just four or five years ago, Shelley and I had the opportunity to stop and have tea with Joan Thomas in Estes Park, Colorado. And uh, this past Wednesday evening, Joan Thomas went to join her Heavenly Father and her husband in heaven. Uh, I understand from her son, Chris Thomas, that uh, the staff where she was being cared for heard Joan say, I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. And a few minutes later, she went to see Jesus. Mike Rasmussen, young man from our church. Uh, you've heard me talk about him a lot over the last 18 months. Uh, you know, he got diagnosed with cancer a little over a year ago. He's been up at Sanford uh, Hospital up in the Pleasanton area for several months getting treatment. Um, they decided that treatment was no longer a possibility or helpful to him. We were able to make arrangements for him to get into Heinz Hospice on Tuesday evening. He was greeted there about 9.30 by a, a lot of friends and family out of the Kerman area. Uh, they had glow sticks and signs and posters and cheered Mike on as he got out of the ambulance. He enjoyed two evenings of comfort and some visits by his, by his friends and some of his relatives. And then um, a nurse early morning, about 5.45, 5.30 on Thursday morning, heard Mike praying, and then she heard him stop. And when she went in to check on him, he was with Jesus, talking to God and going home. I don't know if it gets much better than that. Everybody knows Phil and Hazel Wright from our church, uh, one of our shortest, oldest couples in the church. Uh, they're doing well, by the way. Both of them are doing very well with their health concerns of recent months. Uh, but where they're not doing well is their daughter, Luann, who lives in Colorado. Her leukemia came back and she is now under hospice care. Uh, Luann's daughter from here, who helps to look after the rights, has flown back. She's with her mom along with her brother, and uh, we know that her journey towards heaven is going to be very, very soon as well. So I ask that you pray for Phil and Hazel. Uh, they lost their son just a few years ago, and now their daughter. So uh, just be praying for them, for God's care and comfort. Sharon Haynes, I have good news. Sharon Haynes went home yesterday about noon out of San Joaquin Valley Rehab and at home. She'll continue to be getting physical therapy, but I know she will be so glad to get back home. Continue to pray for Dick Kelton, still been in the hospital, still has needs that need to be taken care of. Hopefully I'll have a, a, an update from his family by tomorrow. Uh, met a new uh, friend this week on the phone. Her name is Tina. Uh, her 42-year-old son, Chad Parsons, passed away recently, and uh, we're scheduling a service for him in July. So kind of a big gap between the loss and the celebration. And so I just want you to remember to pray for Tina and for her family as uh, they're dealing with a loss at a most unusual and challenging time. Um, let me transition out of prayer requests and special needs to uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, today, it's Mother's Day. Uh, when the service is over, we hope you'll come and do a drive through the church parking lot. We have several things for a lot of different people. Number one, it is Mother's Day and we have gifts for every mom. Uh, we, we usually say for every adult woman in the church, uh, we will have them until we run out. We found out with burritos last week, running out is a possibility. Uh, so moms, come by and pick up your gift in the parking lot, all right? I think this is one of those things that Women's Ministries is wanting mom to be present in order to get it, all right? Because we do have a limited supply. Speaking about burritos a moment ago, we did run out last week, sold almost 300 in less than 40 minutes. There were 40 or 50 cars that uh, came through. We had to tell them, I am so sorry, we have run out. So the youth department decided, let's do it again on Mother's Day. So they're making 500 burritos for today, and uh, they'll be available also in the parking lot in a drive through fashion. Remember, these burritos are free. Donation is certainly acceptable, and uh, this is helping our kids go to summer camp this year between our elementary, junior high, and high school kids. Camp is still sort of up in the air a bit, but uh, we are planning as if it's going to happen. So come on by. If you made a donation last week and did a 
and didn't get a burrito, don't feel bad about coming through the line and not leaving anything this week. We told you to come back, so please do that. Uh, you don't even have to feel bad about coming by and getting a burrito and not giving a donation because others are giving in abundance, and we are grateful for that. So burritos are available right after the service. And then uh, the last thing you can pick up, this is the fundraiser we do every year with Pregnancy Care Center. It's the baby bottles called Change for Babies. You take the bottle home on Mother's Day, you bring it back by Father's Day, and all of that goes to Pregnancy Care Center. You can fill the bottles with chains, you can put $5 bills, $10 bills, $20 bills, any bills you want to in the bottle except your PG&E bill, and they will love it. You can also write a check. Uh, if you're not able to get by today, we'll have them in the office that you can pick up at a later time. So three things in our parking lot today. Mother's Day gifts, breakfast burritos, and baby bottles. Hope to see you. Come by and we'll wave at you, all right? Uh, and stay tuned. Uh, pay attention to your emails this week. We may have a very important announcement uh, about our future. All right, so God bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, drive by and also take a look at the new building. Lots is going on. Thank you so very much. Happy Mother's Day. daughter Jordan. Hi, my mom and I have the best relationship. She inspires me daily with her love for Jesus and her love for others. She's the strongest person I know and the best role model for me to look up to. She's always there for me with a piece of life advice or words of encouragement right when I need them. I cherish all of our time we get to spend together, especially right now as I get ready to leave for college in the fall because I'm going to miss her so much. I'm so grateful for all she has done for me. Thank you, Jordan. Um, and the verse that I would like to share with Jordan and, and pass on to, to her as she goes on to her next endeavor at GCU, Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, is um, a verse that I hold very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's a verse that it became my go-to verse about five years ago when Jordan was going through some health challenges and um, with surgeries. And then even more recently with my mom going through treatments, um, the verse is Isaiah 41.10. And that verse says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will hold you, uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I pray that Jordan has uh, many more days of happiness than days of struggle or sadness. But the reality is, 
is that there will be those, those days where it's a struggle. And so I hope that she clings on to verses like Isaiah 41.10 and the several others that are in, are in God's word and God's promise to us, his promises to us. Um, so thank you for letting us share. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Hi, I'm Emily Wildy, and this is my daughter. Hi, my name is Claire, and some things I love about my mom is that she always goes out of her way to do things for me and my brother, and she always told me to stand up for what I believe in. And my verse that I would love to share with Claire as she gets ready to go away to college is Colossians 3, 1, and 2. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And the reason this verse is important to me is because I feel like there will be so many things that will compete for your time and attention. But if you always keep Jesus first in your life and you set your mind on things above, it will drastically change everything for you, the course of your life, how you make decisions, and even how you spend your time. Hello, my name is Ariana Serrano. Hi, I'm Bridget, I'm Ari's mom. And a few things that I admire about my mom is that she is a very strong, hardworking, and loving and caring person. Um, she's always been there for me and just supported me throughout my life and has always helped me um, with the challenges that I've been faced with and just uh, really helped me um, figure out who I am. And something I wanted to share with Ari, um, it being her senior year this year, um, I just want her to continue going outside of her comfort zone. Um, she's learned to do that most specifically this year and she's successful at it. She's strong-willed and she's got a good head on her shoulders and just continue doing it. All right, and I love you. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jackie, and I'm a senior at Clovis High School. I'm Tiffany, I'm Jackie's mom. And what I admire most about my mom is that she gives 100% of her effort into everything that she does. And when that's not enough or when things don't work out, she just trusts that God has a plan. Love that, thank you. You're welcome. My favorite verse that I wanna share with Jackie is Proverbs 3, five through six. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Rely not on your own understanding. Be mindful of him in all ways and he will make straight your path. It's been a verse that I've clung to at different times in my life and I'm so happy that she loves and trusts God and I look so forward to uh, the future that he has in store for her. Hi, my name is Ellie Mata and this is my daughter. I'm Tatiana, I'm a senior at Clovis East High School. I like to say happy Mother's Day. Thank you. And I'd like to share a few things that I admire about my mom. She is very hardworking and caring. She always gives the best words of encouragement. She makes me laugh and she loves me unconditionally. She has been a true guiding light in my life. She has always encouraged me to try new things in school and branch out. Um, she has always kept God in my life and has shown me what a true and faithful follower of Christ looks like and I appreciate her very much. Thank you, Tatiana. So there were so many things that I wanted to say, so it's kind of hard to pick just one. But I love this verse in Proverbs 4.23, which says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. What the Good News Bible says about the same verse, but I like verses 23 through 27, which says, Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Never say anything that isn't true. Have nothing to do with lies and misleading words. Look straight ahead with honest confidence. Don't hang your head in shame. Plan carefully what you do, and whatever you do will turn out right. Avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Don't go one step off the right way. I just think that our hearts are the most important thing. So if we take care of our heart, and be careful what we put in it through our thoughts. I think that's the most important thing and she'll succeed in life. And I wish her all the best. I wish her all the success. I wish her God's love, God's peace in all that she does. And if she keeps God in her life, I know that there's nothing she can't do. Very proud of you. I love you very much. 
I love you too. Thanks. Wow, what a wonderful Mother's Day montage we just had the opportunity to watch. I want to say thank you to uh, Andrew for putting that together for us. And maybe next year when Andrew puts out on Facebook, send me the pictures of you and your mom. Uh, more of you will get those sent in because that was so much fun to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. We're going to jump right into uh, Mountaintop Moments number two. Uh, if you'll recall, last Sunday morning I asked you a question. What's your favorite, mountains or beaches? And I know it's probably about a 50-50 split. For me, it's pretty easy for you to figure out. I've got dozens of mountaintop stories and only got really one beach story. And again, I shared that with you last week. So as you can tell, I prefer the mountains. We introduced a new sermon series last week. And by the time this series is over, I hope all of you are going to become mountaintop persons. At least when I'm talking about spiritual landscapes. You see, the Christian life is a series of mountaintops and valleys. And the way up is not always a straight path or an easy road. There's a lot of obstacles and challenges that we face along the way. But once we reach the summit, we realize the climb was worth it. At the top of the mountain, it's clear air. It's a longer look. And the achievement of getting there is so rewarding. I like to call it perspective. Because once we've arrived... Mountaintop experiences are fresh and invigorating and fulfilling and inspiring. I love that old hymn I reminded you of last week. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. You see, mountaintop moments are necessary for us to survive and thrive our daily living in the valleys of life. We need some of these invigorating lessons as we go through the rugged circumstances that life dishes out to us. Last week, we introduced this series with a look at a mountain climber by the name of Caleb and a giant infested mountain called Hebron. I actually had a couple of people call me this week and say, Tim, how do you spell that? It's H-E-B-R-O-N. We took a close look last week at Caleb's attitude of confident faith and we discovered that through surrender to God, we can have his strength for our struggles and we can claim the mountains. In a few minutes, I want us to learn more about this unique and special place that Caleb wanted so badly. I'll be honest with you, over the last couple of weeks, and I, I have a sense it's going to happen again today, I feel like I'm making you drink through a fire hose, throwing an awful lot out at you, but this stuff is so good. In May of 1996, one of the greatest disasters in mountain climbing occurred on Mount Everest. The climbers stayed too long at the summit. A storm began to blow in, and as they made their way down to an intermediate camp, they were engulfed in a full-scale blizzard. The wind exceeded 60 knots. The chill factor was more than 100 degrees below zero. With their supplemental oxygen tanks running out and their headlamp batteries running down, they found themselves in the struggle of their lives. Fortunately, there were two experienced guides with this party of 11. Unfortunately, these two guys chose the wrong path. John Krakauer wrote a book entitled In the Thin Air. If you like mountain books, if you like climbing high mountains and you want to read about it, this is a thriller. Into Thin Air. In that book, he wrote this. For the next two hours, this group staggered blindly around the storm, ever more exhausted and hypothermic, hoping to find their way to camp. One of the guides said, it's total chaos. People are wandering all over the place. I'm yelling at everybody, trying to get them to follow a, a single leader. Finally, around 10 p.m., I walked over this little rise, and I felt like I was standing at the edge of the earth. I could sense a huge 
void beyond. You see, the group had unwittingly strayed to the easternmost edge of the lip of a 7,000-foot drop, right down the Kainshung face of Mount Everest. The group decided to huddle up and wait for a break in the storm. They were without shelter and not much light and oxygen, and their leadership was confused. Some of the climbers survived, but others died. The sad part is, the tents of their camp was only 300 yards away, a distance they could have covered in 15 minutes. But they had lost their way. Have you ever lost your way in life? Try to find your way back? Don't know where to go? You just know you want to get home? Does home seem a long ways away for you? I hope by the time we finish today, you'll discover it's closer than you think. Let me introduce you to three pretty impressive guys who needed to find their way home, to get back to where they needed to be in order to become who God intended them to be. Though these three guys were born hundreds of years apart, they all shared one thing in common. But before I get to that, let me tell you who these guys are. And most important of all, let me tell you what God said about each one of them. The first impressive guy is the father of God's chosen people. You probably know his name, Abraham. Listen to what the brother of Jesus, James, wrote in his epistle in the New Testament about Abraham out of the Old Testament. In James chapter 2, verse 23, James wrote these words, And the scripture was fulfilled. Now remember, when James wrote, he was writing the New Testament. So when he talked about scripture, he was talking about the Old Testament. And so James said, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Now listen to this next line. And he was called a friend of God. Wow, what a compliment for God to say, you're my friend. The second impressive character is the guy we looked at pretty closely last week. His name is Caleb. And do you remember what, what's written in the book of Joshua, chapter 14, verse 24 about Caleb? And this is God speaking here. And God said about Caleb, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land that he went to. A different spirit. A wholehearted follower. And then the third impressive guy, King David. Yeah, David the shepherd boy, who wrote the 23rd Psalm. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Not only the shepherd boy, David, but the giant slayer, David. Not only the giant slayer, David, but keen, David. Acts chapter 13, verse 22 says this. After removing Saul from being keen, God made David keen. God testified concerning David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. A man after God's own heart. Pretty impressive, huh? A friend of God, a man with a different spirit, and one whose heart is just like God's. That's pretty high praise, all coming from the lips of God himself. What did these three have in common besides flaws? They all had flaws. You're going to discover it's a place it's a mountaintop. They all chose Hebron as a special place. Let's take the time to, to look at the first five times that Hebron is mentioned in Scripture. First off, let me define Hebron for you. The word Hebron is, it, it, it's kind of a um, uh, it's kind of a challenging word to define, but over the years, with the study of Hebrews, this is what they've come up with. Uh, the, Hebron means to be in union with, to share communion with. 
It's a place where you come together. It's a place of friendship. Wow, Hebron, friendship. And Abraham was called the friend of God. The first time Hebron is mentioned in Scripture is found in Genesis chapter 13, verse 18. And this is a place where Abraham builds an altar. Let me just read the verse and I'll deal with context in a few minutes. Verse 18 of chapter 13, book of Genesis says, So Abram moved his tents and he went to live near the great trees of Mamre. I understand these are big, gigantic oak trees. And where was this? At Hebron. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord. That's the first time it's ever mentioned. And so we find in this first mentioning of Hebron that this is a place of recommitment and a place of gratitude for coming home. That'll make more sense when we look more closely at it in a few minutes. The second time that Hebron is mentioned is several chapters later in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, 23, verse 2. And we find out that Abraham goes back to Hebron and he buys a cave. It's the cave of Machpelah. That cave is a very special place today. It's a place that a very limited number of people ever get to see. You see, it's the place that Abraham bought to bury his wife Sarah. It's not only the burial place of Sarah, but Abraham was laid to rest there. It's not only the place where Abraham and Sarah have their final resting place, but it's the place where another couple by the name of Isaac and Rebekah, and then the next generation, Jacob and Leah. When you hear about the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, how does that list start? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All three of them, grandfather, father, son, and their wives. Three famous couples, all buried right there at Hebron, the place of communion, the place of union, the place of friendship. It's a place of reunion and rest. The third time Hebron is mentioned is in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 22. We briefly touched on that last week. It's, uh, it's when the 12 spies were sent in to, to spy out the land and, and, and figure out the way in which God would send them in to possess the land that he had promised to them. And as you recall, 10 of those spies brought back a majority report and said, it's too fearful for us to go in. We'll certainly be slaughtered. And there were two, Joshua and Caleb, who from the mountaintop of Hebron saw the lush valleys and the beautiful crops. It's when Caleb the spy saw its beauty and desired for Hebron to be his. He believed that God could give to them what circumstances indicated was impossible. And it later became his inheritance. You see, on this occasion, Hebron was a place of believing a promise and developing patience. Remember what the New Testament says about patience? It comes through tribulation. Caleb showed patience for 40 years of wandering in a wilderness before he ever got to inherit the promise given to him that day. The fourth time Hebron is mentioned is Joshua chapter 14. It's when Joshua leads Israel back to the promised land 40 years later. And Caleb now, after five years of fighting, so 45 years later, he is able to inherit the mountain. God keeps the promise that Caleb would have this as his prize. Caleb is empowered with strength that only God could provide. And that's when Caleb said, at 85 years of age, I'm as able to go in and come out as I was when I was 40 years old. So here, Hebron is a place of fulfilled promises and incomprehensible victories. The fifth time, oh, by the way, 45 years? Hebron sounds like a place that's worth the wait, doesn't it? The fifth time, Hebron is mentioned is in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. In fact, let me turn there. 2 Samuel chapter 2 reads like this. Uh, background. Saul, the king of Israel, has just been killed. David is going to be the next king. Saul knew it. David knew it. The people knew it. But there was a lot of jealousy among the people between Saul and David. This was not going to happen without conflict. So this is the setting. In the course of time, 
after Saul's death, David inquired of the Lord. Anytime you need to make a next step, we would be wise to do what David did. Inquire of the Lord. And David asked the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? And the Lord said, Go up. It's always a good direction to go, folks. When you don't know which way to go, go up. David asked him, Where shall I go? And the Lord answered. Are you ready for this? Anybody want to guess where he went? To Hebron. Go up to Hebron. You see, Hebron was a place of direction for David. He inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, go to Hebron. It was a place of life. If we were to look at 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2, we would discover that while, while David, now king of Judah, only Judah, not all of Israel, just, just the small part, all right, while he is there leading Judah from Hebron, he has six sons. <laughs> it's a place of life, new life. It's a place of determination and unity. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 says, The men of Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, verse 38, all of these men who volunteered to serve in the ranks, they came to Hebron, fully determined to make David king over all Israel. So Hebron became a place of determination and unity. For on that day, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, David now became king of Judah and Israel, one nation, no longer divided, but unified. So, Hebron, what an interesting place. A place of recommitment and gratitude. A place of reunion and rest. A place of believing a promise and developing patience. A place of fulfilled promise and incomprehensible victory. A place of direction, a place of life, a place of anointing, a place of determination, a place of unity. Doesn't Hebron sound like your kind of place? Not McDonald's, but Hebron. Your kind of place. Let me take just a, a closer look, if I may, at Abraham. The, the first time that Hebron is mentioned is really in connection to the one who was defined and described as the friend of God. In Genesis chapter 12, it tells us of God's promise to Abraham. You, you see, before Abram, and God expanded his name from Abram to Abraham, there was no such thing as the nation of Israel. There was no such thing as a Jew. This became a, a name and an identification that God gave to his chosen people as the result of finding a man of faith. You see, the destruction of the world by a flood had already occurred through Noah. The, life was, the, the, the world was coming back to life. And God looked for a man that he could change the course of history through. And he looked for a man of faith. He looked for one he could call friend. And he found Abram. And in chapter 12, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And here's the promise God makes to Abram. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. It's because of this promise we need to be nice to Israel today because God promises blessings to those who will bless his chosen people. So Abram left. Listen to this. As the Lord told him. Do you respond that way when God knocks on your door and gives you direction? Abram immediately left as the Lord told him. And then Lot went with him. Lot was his nephew. Abraham was 75 years old when he went out from Haran. And he took his wife Sarah with him and his nephew Lot and all their possessions they had accumulated and they had acquired. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah and Shechem. The Canaanites were then in the land, but the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. Do you realize Caleb is his offspring? 
So the guy we looked at last week, all right, he eventually gets the land that Abraham is now in. To your offspring, I will give this land. So what did Abraham do? He built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. And from there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel. Bethel, do you know what the word Bethel means? House of God. Bethel is where Jacob, a few weeks ago, we looked at the character Jacob when he wrestled with God by the the side of the stream. That was Bethel. This Bethel that Abraham found when he got to this new land that God had promised him. And he built an altar there to honor the Lord. Verse 8, from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and he pitched his tents with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So he's a man of promise. But people of promise often run into problems. And the question for us is, when we have the promise of God and we run into earthly problems, what do we keep our eyes focused on? The promise? Or the problem. See, Abraham was a friend of God, but he was not perfect. He had flaws, and that flaw is going to show up right here. There was a famine in the land, societal circumstances. A famine in the land that God had just sent him to. A land of promise. A land that God said flows with milk and honey, but right now the milk and honey were were dammed up. (laughs) They weren't flowing. Is Abraham going to remember the promise or is he going to focus on the problem? And here was his mistake. Abram went down. That's always a bad direction, folks. Going down is not a good direction to go. And he went to Egypt and he lived there for a while because of the famine. And as they were about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know you're a beautiful woman. That's a smart husband. Brag on your wife. I know you are a beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, you're his wife. And then they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. So I want you to say that you are my sister. What's this man of promise doing? He's lying. Why? So that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Just go along with this so we can live for another day. When Abram came to Egypt and the Egyptians saw she was a very beautiful woman and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her. Ladies, do you all realize this is a middle-aged woman and the Pharaoh of a country is enraptured with her beauty. Abraham was one blessed man in a lot of different ways. He treated Abram well for his sister's sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, manservants, maidservants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be maybe my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Verse 13, things are going to change. Why? Listen to this line. So Abram went, which direction do you think he's going to go now? Up. From Egypt to Naev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot with him. And Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. And from the Naev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel. Bethel means what? House of God. Anytime you get lost, your way back home is to the house of God. This is a place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier, where he built his first altar, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And so we find God's promise to to Abraham. We discover Abram's obedience. We discover his devotion and his gratitude. And he builds altars there at the place of, of Bethel. Now, altars in those days, you've got to understand what they were. They were just made out of, out, of, out of dirt, or the scripture says, unhewn rocks. They weren't supposed to use gold and silver or anything. I suspect it was eventually so that they wouldn't break the, the commandment that says, you shall have no other gods before you. They didn't want people worshiping the the altar. They wanted the altar to be a reflection of one who they were worshiping. 
And so it was made just out of unhewn rocks or dirt. It was to be a, a place of sacrifice or a place of remembrance. Something significant happened, and I don't want to forget it happened. Abraham recalibrates his spiritual GPS, and he heads in the right direction. He goes up. But immediately, he's confronted with a problem. In the rest of chapter 13, Abraham and Lot come back to the land that flows with milk and honey. And uh, Lot's got herdsmen. Abraham's got herdsmen. And they start bickering with each other about who's going to get the best land. This, this problem is not a problem between Abraham and Lot. It's a problem between their staff. Before the difficulty struck at the heart of Abraham and Lot, their workers were at war. Jealousy and the drive to be better than crept in. But Abram now, learning some lessons from his time in Egypt with his calm wisdom, saw that it would be better to avoid all such unseemly quarrels by voluntarily going their separate ways. Abraham, with generous disinterestedness, offers Lot a choice. That's found in verses 8 and 9, chapter 13. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before us? Isn't there plenty out there for all of us? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If, if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. This was quite like Abram to do this in keeping with this noble nature, this one who's defined as a friend of God. Abram was a quick student. He had learned his lesson well in Egypt. Self-centeredness and self-protection was not a wise solution. Abram returns not only to his physical home of promise, but also to his spiritual home of faith. And let's look at this dynamic encounter and notice three things. Number one, the presence of moral greatness either raises us or shrinks us. It either prompts us to rise to the occasion or it tempts us to take advantage of it. You see, Lot lost his choice of meeting Abram's generosity. Lot didn't defer to his elder as would have been the appropriate thing to do. He didn't even offer a counter proposal of sharing the land. No, what Lot did is he took personal advantage. That was the first element of his choice. Lot judged according to the world's judgment. He looked at the good land, the low lands, the valley lands, and he said, that's for me. He didn't want anything to do with the rugged hillside. His heart was allured by the beauty and the fertility of the plains. On the other side, the advantage seemed limited and the path more difficult. He totally forgot the God factor in his decision making. He took advantage of of his advantage. The second thing let's notice is the power of temptation at this moment. The power of temptation to Lot, as it is often to us, was that the good alternative had a present reward, while the good of the other choice seemed off in the distance. The one could be seen immediately and possessed now. The other would require faith. You see, the seduction of the world is the here and now. To exercise self-control for the sake of future blessing, to put off a present good for a prospective good, that needs the strength of character and will, and above all, it requires faith. Lot gave in to the law of instant gratification. I want what I want right now, whether it's money or power or sex. We take what we can get right now. The third thing we learn out of this encounter is faith is not being deceived by what we see and trusting God for his unseen promises. You see, worldly wisdom is not very wise. It usually turns up in folly. The blind grasping only for what is within their reach. Lot thought he was doing the smart thing and making the choice he did. But guess what? When Lot chose what he did, do you know who he partnered with? Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't have time to tell you that story, but you probably know it already. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't last very long. Sodom and Gomorrah is a pitiful substitute for a place in Abraham's company and a share of Abraham's thoughts and faith. The end for Lot was a ruined home, a desolate life, and a broken heart. 
What do your choices in life reflect? Do your choices reflect that you are closer to the world or that you live in fellowship with the Lord? Abram appeared to get the short end of the stick of this opportunity of decision from Lot. But I'll tell you what, Lot's the one who got the short end of his own stick and God reaffirmed for Abraham and kept his promise to him. Faith in an unseen promise of God is better than one selfish choice in the hand. And, and folks, some of you might be wondering, Tim, why are you wasting time on this story right now? Do you know where all this happened? Chapter 13, verse 18 in the book of Genesis it happened at Hebron. Uh, the next few occasions that Hebron is mentioned is with the character of Caleb in Joshua chapter 14. We looked fairly closely at that last week. I want to highlight just a couple of things today. Throughout history, some words have inspired the human soul, raising us to new heights of greatness and honor. P perhaps you remember a few of those quotes from your time in school. Remember, Thomas Jefferson said, we hold these truths. Remember memorizing those? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. We are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. How about the lines of Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address? <laughs> oh, if presidents and preachers could learn to say so much in such a short period of time as Lincoln did that day, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Historians declare that Churchill's words inspired not only Britain, but the entire world to stand against Hitler. Speeches like his finest hour speech instilled confidence in soldiers to fight for freedom. Churchill said, upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Hitler knows that we will have to break us on the island or lose the war. If we stand up to him, all Europe may be free. Let us therefore brace ourselves and bear ourselves that if the British Empire lasts for a thousand years, men will say, this was their finest hour. There's lots of other examples of great speeches like Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. But how about the speech so short but so powerful from a seasoned warrior by the name of Caleb who inspired a nation and subsequent generations that followed when he boldly declared, give me this mountain. Give me the mountain where giants roam. Give me the mountain where God keeps his promise. It's called Hebron. Fast forward 45 years from the time that Caleb first saw the mountain till he was able to give the speech to Joshua. Give me this mountain. Fast forward 45 years from that negative report given by 10 doubting spies to the settling of Joshua chapter 14 where Joshua divides the land among the tribes of Israel. After five years of war, five years after the children of Israel first crossed the river of Jordan into the promised land, they had to fight to get the land that God had promised. So, some pretty miraculous battles. Remember the battles of Jericho where walls came tumbling down. Remember the battle of Ai where there was, um, you know, first a defeat and then a victory. Five years have now passed in the land. And the scripture says the land is now being divided up. Can you imagine what it was like for Joshua and Caleb? Imagine that scene. The only two men of their generation who had survived the wilderness discipline, and they now meet to receive the fruit of their labors. 
You see, Caleb and Joshua never doubted the power of God to defeat the enemy and to keep his promise. Joshua, the leader of all the people, calls Caleb forward. I imagine the two embraced with tears like beloved teammates who had just won a championship. And Joshua says to Caleb, old friend, I've saved the best land for you. Choose from all the best that Canaan has to offer and it'll be yours. And Caleb shocks everybody at that moment. He doesn't look at the green pastures of the valley or the, or, or, or the coastal areas by the sea. Caleb looks up at the most rugged piece of land around. It's a land that still has enemies on it. So much of the land had, had already had rest for, from war, but not Hebron. Giants still roam the landscape. And Caleb looked up and he said, Give me this mountain. Wow. I love Caleb. In the geography of the soul, yours and mine, we all need a Hebron. The mountain represents the promised blessing of God and the obstacles presenting, present, preventing us from experiencing what God desires in our life. None of us are perfect. Some of us struggle with finances. Others have been wounded by painful experiences, broken relationships in the past. Immorality and addictions threaten to destroy the lives of some saints. Depression is, is a quiet thief robbing the joy of many who attend church every Sunday. Marriages hang by a thread in one family while another one experiences the heartache of a rebellious child. Cancer, personal tragedy, aging parents with Alzheimer's, the list goes on and on and on. Obstacles threaten our effectiveness as God's servants and create doubt of whether God will deliver. Our natural tendency is to ignore the severity of the obstacle or to run from the battle, but there is a better option. We can follow Abraham's example. We can follow Caleb's example. We can overcome by trusting God to give us Hebron. I think in both of these character stories, Abraham and Caleb, and if I had time, we'd find the same thing is true in the life of David. I think there's a few key pointers to claiming Hebron for our own. The first is we must submit to God's authority. Submission is the humble recognition that God's resources are bigger than ours. The Bible says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he will lift you up in due time. Abraham made a bad choice when he went down to Egypt, but he corrected that bad choice with a good one when he went up to Hebron. He then hoped that maybe Lot had learned something by his example, and Abraham gave Lot a choice, left or right. Lot chose badly. Very different attitudes. What's your attitude about submitting to God's authority? Do, do your choices lie closer to the world or to the Lord? Not only should we submit to God's authority, but we should seize our destiny. Another important lesson is illustrated at Mount Hebron. Abraham had a destiny, the father of a great nation. Caleb had a personal destiny, destiny conquer Hebron. And both of them seized their destiny by trusting in an unseen promise that they knew God would bring to pass. God created and redeemed you for a specific destiny. Not just a shepherd boy by the name of David who would eventually be king, but an 85-year-old man who claimed Hebron as his reward. God needs you, and God needs you, and God needs me to put our faith in him, submit to his authority, and when we do that, we will seize the destiny, the plan that God has for us. Mount Hebron stands as a powerful reminder that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works that God prepares in advance just for you, just for me. These divinely prepared works require our wholehearted commitment.
When we have submitted to God's authority, when we have been willing to seize the destiny God has planned for us, we then serve Him wholeheartedly. We don't hold anything in reserve. We don't compromise with the world, right or left. We go God's direction in our life. Fourth, we then, we then live up to our capacity. Caleb understood the consequences of compromise and the joy of living life to its maximum capacity. The word capacity describes the limit an object can hold. Even though we often think in terms of limitation, capacity also guides us to strive to a maximum level. I mean, have you ever seen a, a chair and it says on the directions, maximum capacity, 300 pounds? In other words, you could gain 100 pounds and still sit in that chair. <laughs> or you might need to lose 100 pounds in order to sit in the chair. But, but capacity has to do not just with limiting, but also achieving. Many saints serve faithfully for a season, but they quit before reaching the fullness of God's call in their life. Remember the parable of the talents in the New Testament? God gave some ten and some five and some just one. No shame in being a, a one-talent person if that's what God has given you. Where the shame is, is if God gave you ten and you bury them in the ground. And you don't use them to the capacity to which God has given you with. And of course, in that story, when you use what God had given you, He ended up giving you more. The psalmist declared in Psalm 139, 16, All my days are ordained by God. By the way, just a side note. You need to memorize that verse during this COVID-19 process. All my days are ordained by God. COVID-19 may have caught you and me by surprise. It didn't catch God by surprise. Your days have been ordained by Him. That ought to give you hope in the midst of problems that God keeps His promise. Christ's followers do not retire from kingdom service we enlist in the army of God and we serve until our death or we've been raptured out. Caleb never stopped growing and striving to honor God. Uh, you know what? You realize they wouldn't let Caleb in church these days because he's 85. <laughs> yeah, I was at a meeting the other night and the pastor said, yeah, whenever we get to open our churches back up, we're going to tell everybody 65 and older to stay home for a while. I realized I couldn't attend his church. I'd have to stay home. I'm 65. Holy mackerel, how'd that happen? Caleb never stopped growing. Caleb never stopped striving to honor God, nor should we. May I just remind you that Caleb at 85 was still looking to outgrow a mountain. Colonel Sanders was 70 when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. Ray Kroc founded McDonald's after his 70th birthday. And Casey Stingle became manager of the world-famous New York Yankees at 75. Folks, don't let age determine your willingness to fulfill the capacity that God has called you to. Uh, let me ask you a question at whatever age you are in right now, whether you're, you're 18 and about ready to head off to college or whether you're in your 80s and not sure where you're ready to head off to. What do your choices reflect? Closer to the world or closer to the Lord? And then we get to share our victories with others. Caleb's children and Caleb's children's children got to enjoy the victory of Mount Hebron. Let me wrap up for today. In May of 1953, two men became the first in history to climb to the top of Mount Everest. Edmund Hillary was a New Zealand beekeeper and an explorer. And his companion was Sherpa. Let me say that differently. His companion was a Sherpa guide from Nepal. His name was Tenzing Norge. They reached the summit together. Whew, can you imagine the summit of Mount Everest? The first two people to have ever made it they attained instant international fame. On their way down from the 29,000, I, I, I didn't stutter, 29,000 foot peak, Hillary slipped and started to fall. He would have fallen certainly to his death, but Tenzing immediately 
dug in his ice axe, braced the rope, linking them together, and he saved Hillary's life. At the bottom of the mountain, the international press made a huge fuss over, over Sherpa's guide's heroic action. Through it all, Tenzing remained very calm, very professional, very uncarried away by all the attention. To all the shouted questions, he had one simple answer. Mountain climbers always help each other. Mountain climbers always help each other. Here to help us today are some of the best mountain climbers ever. Abraham, Caleb, and David. They all are excellent guides to Hebron. As you thought about the question, what did your choices reflect? Are you in union with God or in union with the world? Have you lost your way? Has the world clouded your vision? Do you need to find your way back? Do you need to find a place of promise? Do you need to find a place called home? It's not as far away as you think. Remember, it was only 300 yards away. And they didn't know it was there. Our choices. One thought away from Hebron or the world. And then you and I could maybe become a friend of God. You and I maybe could be one described as a different spirit who wholeheartedly followed him. Maybe we would hear that most incredible compliment. We are a person after God's own heart. Do you need to go to Hebron? It's here today. Let's have communion and fellowship with God. Let's pray. Our Father, sometimes the journey to Hebron, we get turned around and confused. Sometimes in a journey to Hebron, we get lost. Sometimes in a journey to Hebron, we get confronted with problems and we willfully choose to make a wrong turn. Sometimes on the way to Hebron, we become fearful, we become faithless, and sometimes we just even lie to save our own skin. God, you've taught us there is a place that we can all return to. It's a place that we can make an altar, and there we can confess, and there we can renew, and there we can be restored. And there we once again can become the sons and daughters of promise. It is at Hebron that you put us back on a road to being who you want us to be. Because we've returned to the place you want us to be. May today, this Mother's Day in 2020, may this be a Hebron day day in which we decided to stop going down and we start going up and we allow your promise and your power to provide for us what we need to get through the struggles of this world in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>